Tom. Hello there. Hello Great there. to see you. Nice to see you. Uh, so we were just sitting around kind of reminiscing, and uh, I've known you for how long now? Since about 1985. <laughs> Yeah, it's interesting. Um, this conversation is going to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the differences between renting and buying and, and when to know what to do. Uh, because there are certain things that you shouldn't buy and there are certain things that you, well, I'm not going to say shouldn't, but there are certain things that are smart to buy. There are th certain things that might not be so smart to buy. So uh, I want to introduce everybody just so we know who everyone is. I'm going to let you do your own introduction. Wow. Tom Fletcher. Yeah, Tom Fletcher, I uh, used to run a, uh, a rental operation and a sales company, and we sold our sales business to Able Cinetech in 2005. <clears throat> then we sold our rental business to VER in 2000, uh, January of 2015. Uh, so I know both sides of the equation, um, and uh, now I work for Fujifilm Fujinon. So All I, right. Okay, so you're kind of underestimating the value of you in Chicago, but you know, we'll we'll let it go at yeah. that. I mean, you're you're kind of a, a a mainstay of the the both the rental and sales in Chicago. I mean, uh, you know, there used to be a company called Victor Duncan, which was you know we're going back into the '70s and '80s. Right. And I used to rent from them. You probably even we did. did. My sister worked the, there. Oh, she did. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Okay, so, but I mean, there were, those were in the Joe Settlemeyer days and, you know, right. people, we would see all these, these famous Bullmish advertising people there and they had offices in Dallas and this was an NAB, I think. In was Detroit. In Dallas. Right. Yeah, and in Detroit. I'm from right. Detroit. Right. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. In Farmington Hills they were. So, yep. okay, so uh, let's bring our other guests on. Uh, we've got Joe Bogdan, who we both know. Right. And, uh, hey, Joe, how's it going? Good, man. How are you guys? Good. So uh, Joe and I have b both been in pr the production business. People seem to think that I'm like only a manufacturer, but both of you know that I've, I've been in production since almost 1979. Uh, and then I moved to Chicago and I started production here and I met Joe really early on. And now wait, Joe, were you using my gear or were you renting here at that time? Yeah, I was a student at Columbia College, and uh, you had an offer on the board there saying, hey, come work for me, and I'll let you have some edit time. So uh, that's how we got to know each other. I came to work at your place for free to get the edit time, and you had the loft across the street from where you're at now, and that was like uh, 1984. Wow, that certainly does sound like me. I didn't really remember that deal. But that definitely sounds like me. So why don't you tell them a little bit about what you've been doing since 1984? Well, I worked at a few places uh, along the way. Started in corporate video, and then I went to Film and Tape Works for a couple of years. And then uh, started my own business, Bigfoot Productions. And I've been doing that since uh, 1993. And um, after a couple of years of doing that, I'm an editor, but I'm also obviously a DP and a director. And I own my own company and I have probably about five cameras. And I've been over the years, you know, I had beta cams and then moved into HD products like P2 cameras and very cams. And then uh, now I'm into Sony. Uh, I have a couple FS7s primarily, but uh, been shooting with those and been acquiring gear. And, and I have a one ton truck and uh, just a bunch of gadgets and stuff to supplement my gear. But uh, been working for like mostly corporate documentary marketing kind of clients and uh things have been going very well cool uh nino um so you're a little bit more of the younger generation here which we like uh we're all old and uh so but you know again you've seized the web and you're using all the hottest gear and everything why don't you give us a little uh bio on what you've been up to um, yeah, I'm a director of photography based in Austria, but I work internationally a lot, and I'm also a co-owner of Cinema5D.com, uh, together with my partner Johnny Bihiri. And yeah, we, I think a lot of people know the site, so we cover all the news and do a lot of reviews uh, of new cameras. So, you know, we get a lot of cameras in our hands all the time. All right, so let's kind of explain how this this rental thing works, because some people. I know a lot of young people probably, you know, nowadays you just buy stuff and that's all you know. You think, okay, whatever I can afford to buy is what I have. 
But, you know, cameras used to, there was this thing I call longevity. So I was kind of unique in buying a camera in 1981. I bought my KY-1900 at the, uh, what's the name of that building, a film center? In, okay, in New York. You, you know, by te Technicolor. Right. <laughs> yeah, so in 81, I, I bought a KY-1900 for $3,000. It was used. And, uh, but, you know, people said that was kind of stupid because you would, buy, you would just rent a camera. But I figured, no, I'm doing a lot of productions. I was doing weddings and I was doing corporate docs, video. You're a doc guy. Yeah, I was doing docs. And then I moved into fashion video really right. heavily. Uh, but, okay, so the thing was is I figured I'll buy my camera. Uh, and then when I'm not using it, I'll rent it out. And, you know, but we knew that when we bought a camera like that and bought a 10 to 1, you know, Fujinon or... Uh, no, as you know, right? Uh, a or food, Canon. Yeah, usually a Canon. Right, right. Uh, zoom lens that it's good for a decade. Right. So now, Nino, you, uh, I want to ask you, you, could you imagine buying a camera and a lens and knowing that it's good for a decade? Uh, unfortunately not. <laughs> Honest, I mean, if you look at the good, good TV these days, I find the standard that, you know, TV, and I'm talking about documentary and new stuff, um, that they strive for, we have long surpassed. So all the all the newer cameras do way more than is actually needed. Um, so you know, there's still a lot of productions shooting on C300s for broadcast and stuff like that. Uh, but you're right. I mean, the you know the new camera is only new for you know three years, and then you need to move to the next one. The FS7 has practically replaced uh, the C300 for all kind of you know medium range TV productions that strive to get a um, more filmic look because the, the larger sensor look which is really becoming the norm. Um, I personally wouldn't invest in a more expensive camera anymore unless you know I was like a commercial DP really shooting you know with an Alexa or a Red all the time. The people that I know that do own one of those uh, also shoot a lot of other things but they basically you know have to give huge discounts to the production companies in order to be able to actually use it all the time. Um, and then it doesn't make sense to own it anymore for me. So I, I'd, I'd rather rent what I need uh, if it's a high-end camera. And if it's anything below $10,000, it might, you know, it still makes sense to own uh, the camera, I think. Um, I have two FS7s, uh, we, you know, two A7Ss, still a C300, and, you know, a couple of other cameras. Um, and obviously we, you know, we get a lot of cameras temporarily to test, but those are the production cameras and that makes sense for me. Anything that, you know, costs more than fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 is hard to justify these days, I think. Wow, that's interesting because I, I would have thought uh, that uh, that's actually really smart. <laughs> I would have thought that you, you would have had Reds and Alexas and I, I think you do have an Alexa, but you... You had mentioned something, Tom, that uh, how many cameras, like in the high end, have come out uh, in the last three years? Well, since we sold Fletcher, uh, <clears throat> I was counting the other day, and uh, I think I counted 15 new cameras that have come out since that time. So, you know, the different Amiras, the new, the new mi the Mini hadn't come out when I was in the rental business. The, the Vera cams hadn't come out. Some of the Canon cameras hadn't come out. And these are all cameras that are asked for on a regular basis and that just a rental house having to keep up with that is real hard and for an owner operator the advantage of being able to go to the rental house and get the right tool for the job is the advantage of rental and the rental houses will also rent, rent you stuff on a long-term basis so if you need a camera for three months you can go in and cut some pretty sweet deals with rental houses for extended time periods but then you're done it's almost like leasing a car you're you're not stuck with that car you know after your lease is over well and i think that you know a lot of uh, part of the problem is this is that it used to be that we would create a budget and i know this is a new <laughs> thing because a lot of people now say the gig is five grand but it used to be that we would create the budget first so we would say okay we need forty two thousand dollars and on the budget we'd have you know above line items and below line items and we would list camera rental, lens rental, film cost, processing transfer, if we're doing a film right, job, right. whatever it was, beta cam, beta tape, whatever that was. But the thing is, is that 
you know, people now, I'm like a guy in a gear and I go out for X amount a day. Uh, so this idea of having a budget so that you can not feel so bad about renting a particular piece of gear is not an issue. But let's talk about that. What is, are the kinds of gear that you should be renting? For me, it's really lenses because if you, you know, we don't have different film stocks anymore like we used to. I, I still, you know, learned shooting on film in film school, but I actually never did it uh, on, a, on a paid gig. Um, but now it's you know, the only differentiating factor if you want to create a look in camera is basically using different kind of glass. And, um, you know, I own a set of compact primes from Zeiss, I can, but anything... Yeah. Anything different, I would rent uh, if you go. If I go for a specific look, I think there's two sides to the lens discussion. The um, <clears throat> uh, what Nino's talking about is is being able to get the right look for the job. So you want a set of lenses that's going to flare a lot, or you want a lens that's a real clean lens. You go and rent the right tool for the job, and I can see that as a as a good uh, as a good strategy for renting lenses. But lenses, on the other hand, are also one of the things that are going to last a long time. You invest into it, you are going to get a decade yeah. or more out of out of your lenses. Well, I, okay, so there's two sides to that, too. There was, everybody all of a sudden got really jazzed with who owned really good glass, beca but then that 4K glass issue came up, and then that kind of killed that, it, that killed that decade on, you know, with film glass. Right. But I would tend to agree with you. Me... I would invest in, you know, a, a really good zoom lens or a set of primes that I know that will work, you know, 90% of the time for me. And then if I need a kitschy lens like Nino's talking about, right. I would, you know, because it reminded me of this. You remember when you'd have like a Fisher dolly, mm -hmm. the thing cost $90,000, but you only got 80 bucks a day for it. Right. And wh mm. why was that? Because it had this longevity of 30 years right. so that the payout you know, what I would call the payout of, you know, getting your money back was a much longer time period because because you knew it was going to last forever. And actually, that still lasts. My God, if you had a Fisher Dolly from 30 years ago, it's still the same Fisher right. Dolly. But the point is, is that I probably would invest in a really nice piece of glass uh, if I wasn't in a situation like Nino's in, where people like you are constantly giving me things to to hold for a temporary period of time no it really depends on the on the job i mean we never get high-end lenses to test really because we you know that's not our core audience i bought a <laughs> the 21 100 because that's exactly what you're talking about for me is my standard go-to documentary lens um documentary zoom lens but you know for commercial jobs um you are it, this is a much tougher um, industry to be on to be in. So I, I shoot like 50%, I would say, documentaries, and the other 50% is is commercial uh, gigs, and and there you are exposed to a much bigger competition. Uh, and you know, one way of differentiating yourself is using different kind of glass because basically, you know, everybody's using compact primes, everybody's using photo zooms. Um, one way of getting that different look is to use different glass especially when you're not involved with the post-production as, um, as much anymore as you used to be as a director of photography. Joe? Because, you know, they basically don't pay you yeah. for the color suite. Sorry about that. Yeah. What, what do you, what's your story? Yeah, well, I think, you know, I'm with Dino on that. You know, I, I don't rent anything uh, unless a client spe specifically asks for it uh, and, and therefore has the money to do that because uh, they're looking at me as a one-stop solution. Like, Joe, you have the gear. We know you'll shoot this the right way, whether it's you're gonna use your Fuji zoom lens or you're gonna use some primes. Um, they're, my clientele is not looking for something. If they are, it, and that's where I do get into rentals, is when they ask for a specific thing that's probably cost prohibitive for me to own. Uh, for instance, like, you know, used to think like a drone was a pain in the butt to have, but now they're so easy to operate. I bought a drone uh, a couple months ago. It's already paid for itself because it's in the truck. When they say, hey, I, I, I'd love to have an exterior of this, I could bring the drone out, shoot the thing and be done with it. Whereas with something like a specific lens or something, you want to have that all kind of figured out in the beginning and make sure that they have the budget to give that to you so you can go rent it. 
Yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on what kind of work you're doing. So like, you know, I don't want to keep saying back in the old days, but back in the old days, uh, you know, we had very defined jobs. You know, we're doing a fashion video. It wasn't something that you could kind of, there were 14 or 15 people that you needed to do this. It wasn't like, you know, we'd go into an edit room, Joe, and there were, you know, there was the editor, the tape op, the Chiron operator. There were people in the back room. It was, you know, the ADO dude. There were very... <laughs> You're just laughing. I think I did all those positions as, as one person, but I do recall that. Yeah. But there were there were many people. It wasn't just. I mean, there were times when when there was one guy in the edit room, but from the get go, there were a lot of people. And when we would go on location, there were a lot of people. If we were shooting film, you know, you had a loader and an assistant and a second assistant and a camera operator and whatnot. So we're back to that sort of budget thing where you could get any equipment you wanted. You know, so it wasn't an issue. Nowadays, I think a lot of people, they're like, okay, I bought X, Y, and Z, and I'm going to make it work for everything uh, I do. And I used to say, you know, when I'm jumping out of a Humvee in a jungle, I do not want a red Epic strapped to my back. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody's giggling. Who? That's me. All I right. was thinking about, you know, well, if you remember the beta cams, I mean, they, they did everything. So you would shoot with a beta cam and you could... You know, you could shoot almost any project. I mean, obviously, you wouldn't do uh, anything really, really high end, but that camera was made to shoot, you know, any kind of thing. So you're whether you're with a bigger crew or a smaller crew, that camera was the one to use. And of course, back then, those were forty thousand dollars just for the body. Well, you only had two. But they options. lasted ten years. Yeah, yeah. You had two options. You could shoot on. We had three. You could shoot on thirty-five. You could shoot with a beta cam. Or you could shoot on Super 16. I mean, literally in that one time span. Right. Or, I mean, the three-quarter was dead. It was kind of, there were three options. It was really simple. Now there's so many options. It's like, Jens and I have been shooting with this GH5. We kind of like it. I mean, it looks right. really good. It's so great for getting documentary B-roll. And actually, this last piece that uh, we shot, a lot of it we used iPhones because we didn't want to get city permits. We wanted to go into buildings and just, you know, get the shots that we needed. And that was the right camera for the right job. So my concern, and I want to shift the conversation a little bit, is uh, I feel like we used to do, we used to get the right gear for the right job. Now we get gear and we force it to do every job. For the most part, I'm talking about not not you so much or uh, Nino because you guys have a lot of options. But what about this topic of just you know I'm going to go get me something and it's going to work for everything? Because I think a lot of young people have no clue that they can rent stuff. Honestly, I think very often in my uh, situation, often and, and colleague situation now, the problem is that we are forced to use something not because we want to use it. But because the client or the agency wants us to use it, you have more and more, especially in the you know corporate world, more and more big agencies and even companies uh, having their in-house video team or you know they just hire VPs, directors on individual projects. But then they still force you to use their equipment, um, which might be a red. Uh, very often, I'm you know like I like shooting on a red, but you know you have to you, you show up on a job and you just given this this camera basically that you know you have reconfigured and stuff like that so you're kind of forced to to work with what's there available um and you know the the entry barrier is so much lower than it used to be that when the if if a client or a production company or an agency produces a lot of video content they do the math and they're like okay we're just gonna buy this stuff and then they force everybody working for them even if it's freelancers to use their gear and that i think is a problem because um, you know, you very often don't have time to familiarize yourself with it or, you know, have prep time and stuff like that. Yeah, and you, so, you catch all the blame on that too. That's the problem. Mm -hmm. that, that, that has come Beautiful. up like for the longest time. Uh, Axelrod was our biggest rental client. I mean, he, he loved the, the very cams that you said we were renting way mm -hmm. back in the early, you know, in the pre Barack days, even in the right. Barack days. Right. Uh, or, or how do you say it, Nino? Barack, <laughs> Barrack. That's the whole Europe's Barrack. all Barrack. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, he was very cam, very cam, loved it, man. We rented that thing. He paid for those cameras four times over. And then all of a sudden that HVX 200 came out and they bought them all. 
And the same with the Chicago Marathon. They were like, uh, man, we rented so much gear to them. And then the HVX 200 came out and they were getting a lot of owner operators with those. So the owner operator business has kind of killed the rental business too a bit. Uh, well, as a, as a rental house, we yeah. had a choice of staying and renting Vericams and HVX 200s in that crowd. We just saw that getting more and more crowded with owner operators because it was so affordable to be able to go buy an HVX 200 that we kept gravitating up. So we were one of the last companies to buy film. We bought Aericams in, in 2005 and got into the film business at the end. And yeah, I wondered that. That, that. that I never quite understood. Smartest move we ever made. Absolutely the smartest move we ever made. And the reason was is that... <clears throat> Panavision had closed down the Chicago office. They bought Victor Duncan, which we were talking about earlier, and uh, Panavision decided Chicago wasn't going to be uh, all that popular for television and motion picture production because of tax incentives in other, place, in other places. <clears throat> and there were all these people that left Panavision, and we sucked them all up. So getting a good lens technician, we grabbed Al Collins, we grabbed Stan Glopp, we grabbed Jimmy Summers, all these people that knew the film business. And certainly we rented film cameras and it legitimized us into the film community. Uh, did I pay for our ST and LTs? Maybe not 100%, but all the lenses. You know, bought Ultra Primes back in 2005, Master Primes, Cook S4s. Those lenses, when we sold the VER, we sold for almost 90 cents on the dollar for those lenses. Mm. Cameras we didn't sell for quite that much. Yeah, it was a, a move that not a lot of people understood. <laughs> Uh, so, Nino, let's talk about the cameras that you actually like. What, what did you see at Syngear? Or what, I mean, I don't know that a lot of new ones came out at Syngear or NAB, but what are we liking right now and for why? And for what? That's the bigger issue, the for the question, what. I mean, uh, you know, on, on the specs-wise, there's a lot of really good cameras, um, but to really know a camera, you have to work with it for a while. I think uh, a very promising camera when it came out was the C200 from Canon. Um, you know, with it's a very small camera with internal RAW, 12-bit RAW. Um, the problem with the camera is that it only does 8-bit highly compressed or 12-bit RAW. So you're kind of missing the codec in the middle that you would need for 90% of your shoot, uh, which only the C300 Mark II has. Um, but, you know, like if you want RAW in a small package and still have onboard audio and stuff like that, the C200 is a good option. Um, then, of course, still FS7 is still my go-to camera for a lot of things. Uh, you know, it's my standard camera for documentary work and for a lot of other things. Uh, you can get RAW out, which is also great. The EVA1, also great camera from Panasonic. Uh, beautiful image, dual ISO, which is something very useful as well. It's very hard. It's very hard to say. I mean, it's not like five or ten years ago where you had a big difference between each camera and, and huge steps in, in terms of quality between them. Now there are so many options. I think all the big manufacturers now have really, really good options in the market. Even, you know, the Blackmagic cameras have come a long way uh, since the very beginning. And it's it really depends what you're doing. Um, if you need RAW, you still have to go to, you know, you. I think red is still a very good option because they are the only ones that offer you uh, multiple compression sizes of RAW, which is very, very useful when you're shooting, um, which makes the camera very versatile. Um, other than that, if you're shooting anything for broadcast or you know smaller corporate work, there's not really... I, I wouldn't even say there is uh, the camera to go to. There's you, you can make beautiful images with all of the images with all of them, and this kind of makes it very difficult to choose. I would always bet on the one camera that you know the the industry bets on, and and in the broadcast world for super 35 millimeter cameras, it clearly was the C300 for a long time, the original one, the Mark One, and now is the FS7. Um, I think Panasonic was a little bit late with the EVA1. You know, I'm not sure this will catch on. Uh, let's see what's coming next. But I, I, I now see that the broadcast world is... The funny thing is now you need the better cameras to produce online content because you're basically, uh, you know, sometimes they want 4K delivery for online because you have 5K IMAX and all that kind of stuff. 
Uh, for broadcast, you only need HD usually. So the funny thing is that now the low end uh, is kind of good enough for TV, and the high end is is where TV, uh, where the internet and Netflix and all these things are going. So that's kind of interesting to observe. That is, uh, Joe. Uh, what kind of work are you primarily? You're doing mainly still what corporate work. Do corporate um, and marketing stuff, and I do some docu work. I just finished a documentary uh, last week, but the FS7, like Nino's point, the FS7 to me, like when that camera came out, it fills so much of uh, a niche uh, from the 4K to the slow and quick uh, frame rates to you know HD. You know, I I convinced all my clients to shoot in 4K and have the ability to punch in, even though, because they're posting for HD, but the versatility of that camera to shoot, you know, 4K flick of a switch, you know, go to a higher speed frame rate, lower, slower speed, whatever you need, the ability of that camera at the price point, like Nino was talking about, you know, it's, it just makes so much sense for my clients to stick with that camera. Um, if they need something at a higher end, that's where you, I would go to a rental because I'm just not gonna buy something that's gonna cost so much more and I'm not gonna get, uh, you know, the return out of it. So that's where I use a rental for that. All right, Rachel, uh, I wanna introduce Rachel here. She is our, uh, social, uh, she's in our marketing department and she's monitoring the, the uh, comments and everything. What do you have to add to this conversation, Rachel? Yeah, we got a lot of people talking here. Um, Jorge says, uh, you can pretty much rent anything, but I feel that if you're a filmmaker, you do need to have a camera on hand, anything. It doesn't have to be a red or Ari, but something you can throw a lens on and shoot. Whether you're experimenting with a new angle, still learning or anything. Being a DP and not having a camera at all times is like being a painter and not having a single brush would drive me crazy. Wow, so well written. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Jorge. Great point. Uh, Jorge. Yeah, uh, Benjamin Rowland yeah. on that um, front as well is saying that um, it's helpful for me to have a camera. He's got an Ursa Mini Pro because every once in a while he has to put together a shoot very quickly and just renting is just isn't going to be an option. So it's, it's almost sort of seems like what people are talking about here, there seems to be a split between people saying that they kind of almost act, Levi Pike says he becomes a rental house for yourself for his clients' projects. And so that they in and of themselves are being the people who suggest to their clients what they have and then they can rent or not. And then what Nino was talking about, which is sort of like a jump where all of a sudden your clients are telling you what to use. There's like a shift there, um, which is kind of interesting. I mean, I think those are th those are really good points. I mean, I uh, not everybody in the 80s and 90s had the, as a matter of fact, very few people had the ability to have a camera, so you didn't have that paintbrush, and that's a really, really, really good point. Mm -hmm. Because uh, Joe and you, 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 I mean, you know from this, but you know, often we never got to actually shoot stuff till we were shooting because, I mean, what could you really have? You had a Super 8 movie camera or, you know, uh, well, then the VHSCs and the Hi 8s and we were using those things and they were... Th oh, those yeah, the Hi 8. Right, and yeah. then DV, remember? And the, but that's a really good point. I mean, since cameras are so cheap, and if you really just want to learn and, and, and brush up on filmmaking, which I am so into, I'm so glad he said that. Right. Uh, because I hear people that I have come to me and said, I said, well, would you rather do some weddings and some things where you really, really, really uh, learn how to work in a one take environment, much like we're doing right now. <laughs> and uh, you can't beat that or Many of them said they would rather just do one short film a year and work at Starbucks. And that hurts me badly because experience, what Jorge's saying, this experience and the other people of just being able to shoot daily is, is something that we well, did not have that ability, Joe. It's like, the, it's like the, you know, you're talking about the GH5 and, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a relatively cheap camera. I have Sony A7 cameras, you know, the mirrorless ones, the Canons. You put a lens on that, you're out shooting. You're, you're working on your craft as much as you want for pretty cheap, you know, considering what you and I certainly did back in the day, uh, you know, with these cameras that if you 
couldn't buy them, even renting them was costly. And obviously the whole issue about insurance and everything else, but yeah. nowadays you can you can literally buy a, a really nice camera and do some really cool things with it and get some great looks like you're talking about, like you said, with the GH5. That GH5 is good enough for any, it gets to this, this other issue. The GH5's quality or you know cameras like that is totally good enough for any, I mean, for most of the production you're doing on the web, or I'm not going to say TV, but then it get uh, people used to say to me, "Well, when you show up with something that's that small, it mm. almost doesn't legitimize yourself as as a creator of content." Uh, Nina, what do you think about that? It's a very very good point. Sometimes you <laughs> still have to show off your clients, and as particularly when you're working for commercial clients, uh, you see the agency actually wants you to use that big camera, despite the fact that it would make much more sense sometimes to use a smaller camera. Um, so absolutely, I agree. I get a lot of people that want to, you, you know, we're always wanting to put matte boxes on. And we never use the matte box. We were like, what the hell do you need that for? We just use a round <laughs> screw on filter and, you know, polarizer and be done with it. Or we would Hollywood a grad in there with your hand. Uh, but, you know, that matte box makes it look like you've got this professional camera package or whatever. It's just and the follow focus and everything else that goes with it. You know, all that stuff on there does give that appearance. And when you walk in with a small GH5 or a mirrorless camera, yeah, it's a different look for sure. I mean, with the beta cam, yeah, we just that, grab the actually, lens. I mean, uh, Steve, that's what, you know, one of the things that Secudo profited from in the beginning, yeah, when, when the 5D came out, everybody wanted to rig up that 5D, and you guys were one of the first companies who actually made the accessories that made them usable um, as filmmaking cameras, and of course that made the rig bigger, but that was good in this case, because at that time everybody was like, oh, this is a photo camera, are you taking photos? So when you showed up with something like this on a shoot, nobody was taking you seriously, particularly, you know, like five, six, seven years ago. Well, and uh, we didn't do it for that purpose. I mean, it started off where when they came out that HVX 200 and then uh, actually when, when I saw an early version of this 5D, because uh, Jens and I had thought about that. I remember one day we, he, we were looking at his uh, Nikon and we took the back off and we were like, because it, it, it started with those depth of field adapters. And we're like, what if we could just put a sensor right on the back of this camera and then we would have the optical uh, and the, uh, the depth of field that we would have on 35. And we, and we were like, yeah, that would be great. Cause, and we actually experimented with using that leaf. You remember that leaf thing? It's, uh, it's, uh, it's actually still around. It's a 70 millimeter. Uh, it was used for, for, for when we would do uh, like four by five photography. So when we saw an early version of that camera, I thought, oh my God, this is gonna be amazing. I can have optical focus. But then when I got it, we realized, wait a minute, we're holding this thing where like, the second mm -hmm. you look through the lens, it, it, the thing goes bye-bye. Uh, and then I, and, and instantly, I thought, of, I ran and got my Hasselblad uh, loop, and the Z Finder is almost an identical copy of that <laughs> Hasselblad loop and all the crap that we made we made because Jens and I sat around and said how could we use this thing right because it really was sort of unusable and uh, but we did not do it for the look of it but I understand exactly what you're saying yeah. you know uh, but we were laughed at heavily at that first NAB when we showed up uh, with our 5D even Phil laughed at me you know, and then I said, here, just take the thing, go to Hawaii, and because he was going to Hawaii, <laughs> and when he came back, it was like, it was a world-renowned thing at that point, you know, him and Vincent's piece. But uh, that was an interesting time. Rachel, what else do you got? Any other comments? Yeah, Ron Wilson is asked, it says, <clears throat> excuse me, obviously you have to factor in the post workflow since many shooters these days are editing their own projects, which has obviously been a major shift. Is there... Um, he says, if you're an owner operator, this was a huge consideration back in the day. I mean, that's a Nino directed question. What do you think, Nino? Oh, what was the question? The, um, I didn't get the whole question. It was about editing your own project. You got to pay attention yeah, here. He I know said, you got jet lag. 
<laughs> he said, um, you have to factor in the post workflow since many shooters these days are editing their own yeah. projects. If you were an owner operator, this was a huge consideration back in the day. So obviously it makes sense. You're going to have your own software these days. So that's just a whole section of things that you yeah, would I used I mean, to I have to run that you don't know. A lot, a lot of owner operators factor in. They give like a, you know, like a day rate, including their gear. I never did that. I have a, a day rate, and on top of that, I add my gear rate because if you have a fi like a set day rate for you, including all the gear, no matter if it's production or post production, um, you're kind of stuck because that means you know a client would just say, well, last time you charged, I don't know, a thousand five hundred for that day. Uh, but this time we need, you know, the dolly, the crane, whatever, is this all included? And which is why I basically, I always offer, like I, I do quotes like a rental house. I would just say, well, this is my day rate. And this is, you know, this camera package with these lenses costs X dollars. And then there's the crane and then there's this and that and the gimbal and whatnot. So I would always add that. And the same is true for the post-production stuff, I guess, because... I would just have a you know a fixed rate for a post production editing day, and that includes the work and the rental kind of of the editing suite, just that, like a production company would you know rent out a, an, an editing suite for you know, any production really. That's a really smart idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna let people in on a little secret that, I mean a few things that screwed me up in the last 35 years. I one time did a production, and we used to say it's a you know an eight week production and uh, an eight minute video and a five day shoot, you know, when you actually, the shoots went slow, not like now, because you had a, a lot to do. And it was like a formula, I could change those, those parameters and all the, the line items would change. Well, one time I did a video and it was supposed to be a seven minute video and we actually liked it at three minutes. So the client comes back and they're like, oh, mm. okay, so change that parameter and I only want to pay for the three minute video. <laughs> so at that point, I used to say any project seven minutes or under, uh, eight weeks or less, you know, you have to kind of couch these things because he brings up a good point. You know, next time they could say, oh, well, last time, you know, you're going to get that. So I like that idea. You should have your fee. You should have various different equipment packages and a la carte items. Um, and if you're doing a, I don't know, are you, are, are people still doing a, like when we would do productions, we would say it's 40 grand, it's 30 grand. Uh, are, are, Joe, are people still doing that? Or is it like, are you, are, is it like, you know, I'm this much a day with my gear and editing is this much a day with, uh, gear. How is it going these days? Well, for the most part, you know, at least in Chicago and in places I've been, you know, it, it's a package deal. So you're usually selling you know, um, yourself with a, a, a typical package. So this camera, um, audio package, some lighting, and then from there you, you start adding in, you know, whether they need a, a dolly or a jib or a drone or a gimbal or whatever else you might need. Those become all the extra items. So it's, it's kind of nothing's changed really as far as I've been doing it because I've always sold myself, you know, with, a basic rate now that rate changes over the years but you know because his costs go up and crew goes up and stuff like that but that's pretty much how i've been doing it and then i just uh have the extra a la carte line items to uh, add to that i mean i was always a production company so i never i had to give them a flat number they would say you know if i'm going to jim bean brands which is a big client of ours they would say okay how much is this video going to be it, it, they didn't care. It didn't. You couldn't go back and say, "Well, you know, uh, it took us an extra five days of editing." They're like, "We don't care. You told us it was thirty grand. That's what it is." Mm -hmm. You know, and in the budgets in those days, I don't want to be winging these numbers around, but they were much higher because the cost to production was much more expensive. I mean, you know, editing was, you know, you had a whole, you had a, it was a two-stage process. The online portion of it could be three to five hundred dollars an hour in the room right and you had to know how to estimate how many hours it would take to complete this project after you did a a rough cut that they approved nino are you doing any jobs where that you just say this is the amount and that's what it is oh uh, yes definitely but i do still list as much as i can because i want to be transparent for the client 
I think it just gives them more peace of mind when they see, oh, actually, you know, they're not just saying it's whatever, 30,000 euros or dollars and uh, not actually telling me how much work is involved. Because a problem with a lot of uneducated clients is that they don't actually know how much work and how many people are involved in a, like a real production. Like last year I had a, a big corporate which was, you know, like a almost two week shoot and then three weeks of, of post production. Um, you have to tell them, you, and they've, this is the first time they actually, you know, hire a production company, my production company, to do something like that. So the more detailed you can be in your quotes, uh, the more transparent it's, it is, and you know, the more convincing it is as well, because then they see, okay, well, we have X amount of shooting days, and they estimate a specific number of editing days. Now, if it's more than that, of course, you know, like if it's within the set amount of versions they would get, I would still supply that. Let's say, for example, I would say to a client, well, you know, you order a um, film that is five minutes long, and then there are two correction cycles inside, meaning the client can come back to us two times to actually tell us, change this, change that. They can actually say, scrap the whole thing and re-edit the whole thing one time, and the second time it's just small minor changes. So, and usually it works out that way. Usually you need at least two correction cycles to come to a final pro uh, product. With some more annoying clients, uh, it might take a little bit longer. But you know, when I, when, I, when I quote for two correction cycles and it takes a third, fourth, fifth one, I can charge for that on top. As long as they sign the contract, you know, that's, I can do that and they would never say no to that, I guess. So I, I think it's very important uh, and also the point you mentioned about post-production, it's very, very hard to estimate uh, how long the editing of a project takes before you've even shot it. Um, so especially these days where more and more even commercial projects tend to look more like documentaries, um, you, you know, sometimes don't know how much footage you end up having. So that's why I try to you know, factor in these correction cycles and at least have some kind of safety net in terms of how much time and money it's going to take. Yeah, well, I like the correction cycles. You know, we call them rounds <laughs> of change. I know Joe loves that. We call, it, we, we call it rounds of change. You know, we say you get, you get two rounds of changes. <laughs> but I think you should use correction cycles now, Joe. I know, I agree. I, you know, and I agree. The, the whole part about being transparent too is that a lot of clients, if they see everything that's involved, uh, to me, it's a better representation of you know where the money's going. So uh, if there is a not a dispute, but if there is like a you know, hey, we need a trim, or do we really need this or that? They, it, it's better to be transparent and show them what the costs are and break it down as much as you you think you should uh so they can see all the work that's involved in in a you know it could be a one minute video or it could be a seven minute video uh, it, it really is different based on what you're actually producing so having all that kind of stuff in front of them really helps you know i think sell the whole project uh for the client on their end yeah i couldn't agree more uh, okay, well, I'm gonna. I want to. I want to just round this out, and we'll ask uh, for some if there's any more comments. But how many times, <laughs> Joe? And this Nino's probably doesn't have this happen. Have you had? Uh, this is in the old online days. Uh, had you had an edit master held hostage? Uh, there's been a few times, and you know, you know who I'm talking about, but yeah. Oh uh, God. So Nino, uh, this is how this goes. This is how this goes. So you would you would go and edit your project. And then there was this sort of random element, like, they, do you know what an ADO is? Yeah. Oh, you do, okay. So like, they would say, well, when you use the ADO, it's 125 extra. When you use the Chiron, it's 100 extra. When you use this thing, it's a, if you add another deck, you know, to, uh, it's this much extra. So when, when we got done, uh, it would be like, he'd say, okay, your bill is eight grand. And you'd be like, whoa, I thought it was going to be like five grand. And he's like, well, when you get the eight grand, you can have your master. And he knows your client needs it like the next day. So I think I've had maybe, I had one film project that they, that it, you were there when I was doing that film project, a film edit. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and 
Go ahead. Yeah, Allied <laughs> Film and Video. I don't know if you remember them. They held me hostage once. Uh, uh, I've had several from who you're talking about hold me hostage, you know. Uh, it, it was a more of a rough and tumble game back then. It was the Wild West. So have you and had you one? You would pay. Oh, you'd you pay. pay. You it was hostage, to. man. There's, there's, no, there's nothing posted on Dropbox. No. There's, nope. one, there's one copy of that finished product that you've been working on for three weeks, and <laughs> no he's got Dropbox. it, and you need it. <laughs> yep. Nino, did you ever have one held hostage? No, but what I do have is sometimes uh, clients or agencies holding hostage very expensive uh, storage media like Red Max, right? So Ooh. you just send it to them, and they never send it back, or they send it back like two weeks later and uh Ouch. You know, it's not like you have them lying around like candy yeah all right i want to round this out uh rachel do you got any other comments yeah i got a couple of stuff on this last uh kind of section of the conversation benjamin rowland says i've only ever shared the final quote price never itemized after i get the particulars and then if they can't afford the quote he discusses ideas on how money can be saved and uh, Diogo Agatini sort of comes at it differently. He says, ideally, labor needs to be specified separately from the actual gear, which is what I think Joe was who was talking about that. We, we used to but call maybe that on the above, low end, above very, and below line, but go on. Yeah, on the low end, very few people do that. Normally, people just want to get the job, which is fair these days. But uh, I want to particularly highlight a comment from Rod, who um, – I happen to know has a C200, which is quite interesting. He says, I think most towns have their red guys, Sony guys, Canon guys, etc. I'm happy being a Canon guy in my town. People here know I own those camera systems and can call on me for a quick turnaround when that's what they want. Around here, when a production comes in a town, they're usually calling me just a few days out, which makes it difficult to order a rental in time. So he's sort of staking his reputation in town on if you need a Canon, this is the guy you go to, which is an interesting way to do it. I like that. Go on, Nina. Yeah, because uh, I completely agree. These days, you often get hired, and, you know, whether you like it or not, because you know and have one camera. Because there are so many different camera systems out there, clients know, uh, production companies know that you know you need to actually know a camera, and uh, in order to be able to shoot, you know, good image with it, good images with it. So um, you would be hired because I mean, I get hired because I'm. One of the FS7 guys, you know, I'm also a red guy, I guess. Um, I rarely get hired for Alexa stuff. I have shot with Alexa, but I don't do it every day. So they hire somebody else. So and I think that didn't used to be the case so much. Joe? Yeah, I mean, for, for, for me, you know, that my clients know the gear that I have. And if I get an external client that specifies something, then I just go rent it. But yeah, I'm, I'm certainly more comfortable using the camera that I use or cameras that I use all the time just because, you know, I have the much more experience with them. So that's my clients know the gear I already have and they could say, hey, I want to use the FS7 or I want to use this camera. But for the most part, uh, they're comfortable with whatever I, I'm offering them. Uh, okay, I'm going to wrap this out. Nino, I know you're really tired because you got some jet lag. You just got back from Sin Gear, but thanks for thanks. being on. Uh, Joe, amazing seeing you. Come down here. I haven't seen you in a long time. Got to have lunch. Will do. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Tom, as usual. Good to see you. Great to see you. Rachel, we're going to pass it off to you and let you wrap us out. Okay, sounds good. So thank you everybody for joining and for being part of the discussion. Um, as a little treat, we're offering free shipping on all Zacuto store orders for the next 48 hours. You can use it in combination with our summer specials, which are running right now, which is $100 off our Z Finders and $250 off Graticals. Uh, the shipping code is below. I will add it to the video description. So thank you guys for watching and we'll see you next week. Bye.